when you want to. Yeah, so I hope everybody can hear us now. Should be at least we have two attendees. Yeah, it's growing. Yeah. yeah. So we can let take two minutes until everybody is coming in and then we can start. I will already start sharing. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Cool. Perfect. <laughs> so I th I see we have already a high a message. <laughs> <laughs> Annabelle, are you taking over the chat? <laughs> yes, I will take over the chat. <laughs> We've also the attendees. The speaker can also chat. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Let's wait a little bit. <clears throat> no, we can. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Lee, for your comment. <laughs> yeah, I actually miss real life sessions, but what can you do? <laughs> So oh, I would suggest to wait two more minutes and then we can start. Okay. Are we good to go, Annabelle? Yes, we are good to go. My introduction will make them come. <laughs> <laughs> we will just arrive for the important stuff. Exactly. <clears throat> I can start? Yeah? Yes. Okay. So, um, hello everyone, uh, welcome uh, for uh, Data Plus Women uh, Zurich. Um, this uh, time it's a special cartography. We have awesome speaker, but I will let Olivia uh, speak and present uh, her, uh, this great lady today. Uh, somewhat about the initiative, Data Plus Women is an initiative that was uh, created some years ago and it exists in different 
cities and countries. And uh, I'm very like uh, emotional today because it's almost one year that we launched this initiative with Zurich uh, in Zurich with Olivia. And uh, with the COVID, we um, so before we had like physical event and we continue to do this virtual event on that time. And yeah, well, I'm very proud of you, Olivia, <laughs> and what we have achieved this year. Uh, so yes, yeah, the goal is really to uh, promote and celebrate the achievement of women working with our own data. So if you are interested to speak, please let us know. You can follow us like on social media, on our Twitter account. You can send us email. You will find us. Um, and I think, ah, yeah, so uh, we will have this beautiful introduction. So, uh, yeah, myself, <laughs> I usually lead in uh, Fontobel, and Olivia is a data scientist working at Credit Suisse. And um, after our presentation, we will uh, have like a virtual coffee, so please stay uh, until the end. <laughs> All Olivia. right. <laughs> Thank you, Annabelle, for this warm introduction. I'm also happy that we are again hosting another virtual event um, this year. I don't even count the events anymore. So is it the fourth one or so? We have a lot and we have a lot of interesting people. And today especially, and um, this is a very special event because as Annabelle already mentioned, it's all about cartography. So I'm really um, excited um, to introduce you to our speakers. Um, so we will start off with the keynote by Sarah. Um, it will be followed um, by a presentation from Cleo and Sarah again. <laughs> and then we will have an Apera networking session um, as already announced. So I will quickly introduce you to the speakers, but um, I hope they will also tell you something about themselves and their interests. Um, so Sarah is actually a professor of geography at the UZH, the University of Zurich. Um, yeah, as she, I guess, will tell you um, in her presentation itself, she's leading the Geographic Information Visualization and Analysis Group. Um, her research interests also lie in Geographic Information Visualization, and I hope we will hear some interesting stuff about that. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. Um, then we have Cleo who is an assistant professor of urban analytics at the Georgia Tech. Also, um, she has a similar background in geographic information systems. And I believe also her, re her research is focused um, in this area. So excited to see <laughs> what you're gonna show us. And then um, last but not least, we have Sarah. She is a lead research staff at Tableau. I hope you can see it um, at what she's wearing right now, a Tableau t-shirt. Um, also her primary area of focus is cartography. And this event is all about cartography. So um, I'm really excited to hear um, more about her work and what she's actually also doing at Tableau. Um, so as you can see, um, many interesting and exciting topics. And so I hope um, we can kick this off with um, the presentation of Sarah. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks. This is a, a very cool event. Um, it's the first time actually that I participate in such a public kind of webinars, uh, Zoom virtual session, and uh, I'm especially pleased to, to do it with very cool women. Um, so this is a fantastic. I hope you can hear me, um, and uh, it, I'm very hum I feel humbled uh, to to speak with my uh, co colleagues uh, in in geography, GI science. So um, thanks for this. Uh, I will try and do um, something difficult. Uh, let me see. Uh, first of all, share the screen. Um, we'll try that. Um, have you been practicing uh, with uh, my students on this. So I hope uh, you will see something. Uh, please just, yeah, thank you. Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, well, cartography. Uh, for some of you, uh, this will be obvious. For some of you, it will not be obvious. So I, I will start just a, a very generic, uh, assuming uh, you may have never heard of that particular term. You have used the products every day, probably today, several times. 
but cartography uh, basically what is it well let's say it's kind of putting geographic data uh, on maps right it's about data plus women so here we go uh, geographic data on maps it's a very simple definition let's let's go through it a little bit more um, basically you can say you know oh well we have uh, a product everyone knows it on their smart device has not everything been mapped by that company already uh, maybe maybe not um, and so what we are interested in is not just you know creating maps uh, or using them for navigation but it's also to think about more deeply about what if we can put all our knowledge and all our tools and technologies together what is this a sort of map of the future what is actually not what we have now what is in the future what is the kind of uh, navigational device perhaps or geographic information display what would it look like will it be projected on my retina will it be put in through some ways channels into my brain this is the group that i um uh, i'm leading and we are interested in these sort of futuristic questions so we have a world we want to represent it to depict it and how do we do this? You know, traditionally we put it maybe on a piece of paper or on a screen. Um, it can be 2D, it can be 3D, it can be a virtual environment, which we also work in. And basically these are all the things that we do. We, we have, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse, we have, you know, these traditional screen-like displays. Um, we, we do also, we use maps uh, in the sense of a window to a large database. Uh, so we are also applying and using data mining techniques to extract geographic information, to enrich it and to translate it in some ways that people can make sense of it because people don't like to look at, you know, a database as such. We sometimes turn even non-spatial data into a, something like a map. So imagine large text, unstructured text. We want to sort of get an insight quickly into a large unstructured text database. And then why don't we make a map out of it? Uh, and maybe we can see relationships appearing there. So this is the area of spatialization that we also look at and, and work in. We create tools, uh, we study tools, um, and this uh, leads me to these kinds of tools of the future. You know, maps are used everywhere. They are even worn on um, maybe skirts or t-shirts uh, woven into certain fabrics and maybe on a, projected on some glasses or that you will look through it, them uh, with the maps, but you will look into real space. So we can imagine all sorts of cool things and of course self-driving cars using the same kinds of products. And then what we want to specifically do to see how maps actually help us create uh, a better future, right? Smart city is one, one topic, uh, or maybe helping us making better decisions, more accurate decisions, um, smart decisions, wise decisions. Um, and so we actually study human behavior using maps of all kinds and sorts. Um, and so I want to, this is a very broad overview, what we do uh, in, in our group, in, in this group at the University of Zurich, but the best way is actually to, to give you a, a little snippet, a snippet of a study, and I'll talk about this later, what I mean by all of this. Okay, so I have to give you a definition of cartography. I, I'm, you know, a scientist, so, um, who am I asking? Where do you find the definition of cartography? Well, we will ask the specialists, and this is called the members of the ICA, the International Cartographic Association. Yes, this is ex an existing cartographic body. It's the United Nations of cartography, if you like. In fact, um, countries are member, uh, member states, member uh, members, and then within the countries, there are researchers and they're reorganizing research groups. So the definition of the ICA, as you will find in their documents, is basically this. Cartography is the art, the science, and the technology of making maps, and of course also using maps. So that's the official definition, and you'll find I have some references at the bottom. You will find these definitions. So the product of cartography um, is of course the map. And the map used to be, you know, a piece of paper, maybe parchment, maybe even drawn in, but with a stick in, in the sand. Um, but nowadays, of course, the map is lots of things. And if you want, okay, we can define it as a visual representation of some sort. And it's of a environment. It doesn't have to be Zurich, the city of Zurich, or 
the campus of Georgia Tech or the Tableau area in Seattle. No, it can be even a text database, right? So it's really a very generic definition. A map is a visual representation of some environment. Maps, of course, they should matter. We don't just create them just to have fun. Of course, we do that too, but that's another story. They should be relevant for, for humans, right? So they should matter, they should raise interest, they should be engaging, hopefully, and hopefully, and that's the purpose, instantly understandable. Um, you know, here it is, right? This is pro probably the information display um, that actually puts cartography on the map, literally. You know, within a year, I think the most looked at product um, that cartographers can make, so something like this interface here, the COVID-19 dashboard, generated, of course, uh, by uh, the, the folks at John Hopkins University. This is probably the viral thing that cartography or, pro or, or methods from cartography and geographic information science and systems have produced. And you're looking at it and probably you didn't know that this is actually a cartographic product. Now, this is global, right? It's accessible by everyone, everywhere at any time. The question here would be, is it truly understandable for everyone and in fact can people actually see the pattern so i'm doing something and if you don't see a change and if you're male which is actually five percent of you that will happen you probably actually won't have even noticed that something changed because this new map that i show you now is actually how people with a color deficient vision um, typically red green of color deficiency would actually see the display. So if you don't see the difference, well, then you probably have uh, that color deficiency. So this is a very simple example to tell you that if we create products that are globally accessible by anyone in, and uh, of any kind of background, um, then we need to worry about or think about, well, how can we make these products um, such that in fact, the intended view is actually also carried over and people are seeing what I intend to show as a cartographer. Okay, so if this is given that we, we create products as everyone uses on their smart devices, on their screens, uh, in 2 and 3D, then we have to really think about, okay, how do people actually look at these things? Um, can we know something about how people look at displays or look at the world? that I need to know to develop the screen or the display or the data display in such a way that actually I can be sure that they actually are seeing what I'm trying to tell them. So basically, let me give you an example here. Um, and of course, as a, as a result, I want to create design principles that work uh, for everyone, everywhere, and at any time. So let me give you, this is you in the middle, right? You're looking at this display that we know all now. Um, and the question is, you know, what do you see, right? Uh, you can maybe see some red dots. Uh, maybe there's this in this corner, some yellow stuff, and then there's some text and some, and some kind of thing. So if you've never seen this before, you see it for the first time, it will take you some time to parse this display. All right, so here is another one. Let's give you some totally new thing. You've never seen this before. For those of you who have just, you know, let uh, maybe even write people in the, write in the chat. What do you see, right? I'm showing you a display. This is the first time you may be seeing it. And then I'm asking you, what are you actually seeing? And people will say, I see some, I don't know, some gray stuff. And I see some, uh, here's some gray stuff. Some people see a satellite image. There's some river stuff going on here. Maybe there is uh, some other stuff over here. People will come up with all sorts of, of explanations, right? Anyone want to say or to write in the chat what that could be, what we see, what we are seeing? And uh, I'm just going to go on and give you the, the chance here to, to, to venture and, and think about what you would be seeing. We have some right. ants as a turtle and a cow. Yeah, a turtle, great. Uh, and a cow. Well, there, that's, that's, <laughs> that was easy, wasn't it? I'm Swiss. I'm from Zurich. And I, you know, of course, we have cows in Switzerland. So now I'm giving you the cow because I'm sure many people have not seen that cow. Right? So basically, you were able to see a cow because you've seen a cow before, right? And, and therefore, maybe you made out of this kind of pattern, this cow. 
So basically, this is what's happening with any data display. And it's not just cartographic. So when we look at something for the first time, a very cool Tableau display, right? We have to parse it in some way. We're looking at the pattern. And if we have seen the pattern before, we can make an inference of what that pattern could be. And um, basically, this is what's happening. So we have a bottom-up process going on, trying to parse the red dots and trying to make it uh, connect somehow with something I know about, which is memory, and trying to say, oh yeah, I remember red circles, and if they're bigger, there's more, and things like that, right? So if I show you that cow again, there's no way you will ever forget that this display has a cow. I don't even need to show you the edges of the cow face, right? So this is fundamental. So once you've seen that pattern, you will not forget it. And that is very important for us data experts when we create displays to remember that we are the experts, we have the knowledge often, and we are generating um, displays and we sort of assume it's obvious what we can be seeing here, right? So that is something we are um, researching. We are trying to figure out what are the basic principles, how people look at displays, how does that connect with uh, how people process uh, using cognition, neuroscience, uh, all sorts of um, uh, sister sciences, so to speak, that help us uh, understand how people actually look at visualizations, cartographic and non-cartographic ones, and then trying to come up with better displays um, because we can always improve. Okay, so with that, I want to now, this is sort of a general intro. This is sort of setting the stage of what we do um, in my group. I want to just give you a, a, a concrete example. It's always best to give concrete examples. I'm gonna whiz through this because um, actually um, Annabelle will have to tell me sort of about time a little bit. Um, so example, right? Where do we need maps uh, for navigation? Yes, uh, but it's not just about that, uh, that company that generates these maps on our smart devices. We also need maps or the state's uh, devised maps. For example, to keep us safe to uh, delineate areas um, in landscape, in the landscape where we can build houses and we, we should not build houses. And you can see here is an example. Here is this house. And uh, basically, not a minute too early, the government told these people, you should leave now your house. And uh, literally, this is a true story. Um, you know, the rock file happened very soon after. So why is this house there? Or why shouldn't it be there? Well, the government creates maps and tells us about hazards and risks in the environment. So this is a, a state um, task. And this is the Swiss version. I didn't do it. I didn't make it. So, you know, I, I'm not responsible for the colors and for the design. But the question is now here, is this design appropriate? So red means, in essence, in these government issued maps that we have a, uh, a landscape here, if you like, or a graph um, on the y-axis. We tell you something about the intensity of a hazard happening. And then here on the x-axis, the probability of a hazard happening in a certain area. So you here see a, a snippet of Locarno, a city in the Ticino, and uh, there's a lake and there's the border of the lake. Um, and the red means basically right here, you're in the high corner here. It's um, if something happens, and in fact, the probability, relatively speaking, is, is high, um, well, then the, the disaster will also have a high impact, a high intensity. So these maps exist, they've been issued for you know, des decades. And the question for us was, can we improve the understanding of these maps? There are the three factors always in design, right? There's the, the thing that you're designing, then there's a user using your design. And then of course it's use context that matters. Same in any data visualization, including cartography. So let's look at the design. Um, these maps are 2D they depict or should maybe depict some kind of an uncertainty in the data, that's the idea. And then of course, it's a modality is static, it's not an interactive map. So here we had a grandiose ideas influenced by colleagues uh, in the research domain of cartography. Well, we should actually show that in fact, these lines here that in the graph, they are mapped into the geographic space, they are rather uncertain. It's a model, right? This is actually a computational model and then here, these lines are actually, you know, as I said, in terms of locational 
uh, or uh, certainty. They're, they are actually uncertain. So here is the official map. And then I, the idea is I want to show the uncertainty of that actual border switching from the red zone to the blue zone. There are many ways to do this. Here are three examples. We can change the lightness of the display. We can change blur the focus. And we also can use lines here. And the question was, which of these three examples would perform better, perhaps, as the traditional map communicating actually that uncertainty. In fact, that traditional map does not communicate the uh, model uncertainty. So here we go, some results. So we gave people a task to locate houses and to rate the houses based on some criteria. This is a, based on a hedonistic house model. We don't need to go into detail, but basically each house, so here's a house, got a score. And the higher the scores toward four, the more the, the houses are actually in the danger zones and the lower the score. So this is a definition that we created to have this experiment. So the question is, given these house scores, people having to buy a house, they get money and they give the, we get, give them the information of um, where it is based on the criteria. They have some, you know, big houses, small houses, expensive houses and so on. And we give them the money and then we say, would you buy this house? And then, of course, it's located in one of those three zones. So if we use the regular maps, and what's, what is happening? What we see here is that people are more on the secure side. So the more, the higher the value here, the more the likely the house is in the danger zone. So this is how you read the graph. You don't even need to know what four means, but it means houses more in the highest category in the red zone are being bought or down here more houses are being selected that are in the, in the safe zone. If I add uncertainty information, if I modify the boundary here, look what happens. Actually, people are more likely to even buy a house in the red zone. And if I change, for example, the blurriness of these zones, maybe a little less in the red zone. And you can see here that just the fact that I add the uncertainty information of the boundary zone, I visualize that it changes how people would actually select a house to buy, whether or not it is in a red zone, a blue zone, a yellow zone. Again, red is dangerous, higher number. Blue is sort of middle and the yellow is the safe zone. So this is to show the power of visualization that people actually change their, their the decision making just because we choose to change uh, some key, uh, important detail, namely, to choose to visualize uncertainty or not. And then we can ask, why is this happening? So what we do here, we look at a display. This is an actual stimulus where people had to respond. You can see here the criteria of the houses that we are shown here, and they have to make a selection decision which house they would buy. Well, here we can parse the display, um, the delineate sort of areas of interest, and then we can quantify these areas of interest in terms of we look where people actually look in the display, where their eye gazes land on the display before they make the decision. So this is called eye tracking research. And so we can actually quantify how many times the eye have actually looked at this zone of the display or the boundary zone of interest or the response box and so on and so forth. So the, how down here, you can see how long it took people on average um, in terms of looking at these different zones, right? While answering the question. And for us, it was interesting to see to specifically look at that boundary zone, did they actually look at the changes that we made to the boundary? And if it was blurred, you see this is the tan color, they actually, statistically speaking, looked longer at the boundary zone than when the display showed this kind of uh, uncertainty, right? So even showing uncertainty and manipulating the way we visualize uncertainty will affect how people spend time on a display to actually parse the information. Um, I'm not giving you the whole story, it's just to show you that we actually can use visualization again to understand how people look at visualization. So we visualize the output of the eye tracking research um, to be able to understand how people look at display. Um, I'm looking uh, at uh, my co-hosts, uh, how are we doing on time? I don't hear anything. 
I think it's uh, it's okay. We still we, you're on track. You still have uh, maybe Come five on. minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Because now comes the kicker of the story. We in visualization think that visualization is the important piece here. Unfortunately, and I'm saying this with a bleeding heart as a cartographer, the more I do this research, the more I understand that in fact, the design is always last. It, the most important is actually the user. Surprise, surprise, right? So what do I mean by this? So we have users um, that look at our displays. So for example, let me ask you now, we have two lotteries, lottery A and lottery B. And I'm giving you the score, the odds, you can, um, here are the odds, right? To gain 40 francs um, in this lottery, uh, or the odds actually, um, uh, the, the counter odds if you want, to, to lose money, quote unquote, right? So here is a second, so this is lottery A. Here, so you see, I mean, the odds for getting 40, you know, compared to the odds to getting 32 francs. Here, the lottery is a li slightly different. You have an odd to gain more money, but at the same time, you, you know, you may lose, right? And get less money. So these are two lotteries. And we give this task, many of these kinds of tasks to our users before they did the uh, house selection. And what we can do by this, we can actually assess whether um, how risk seeking or risk averse these people are, how they actually choose the lottery in this lottery game. So this lottery B is higher risk, right? More gain, but it's, you know, higher risk to actually not get the 77 francs. And this is a table, for example, and you can see if you're up here, you are gaining money. And if you are going down here with the games, um, actually the odds and the gains are getting more and more um, sort of, play against you, uh, you are more likely to lose and the, 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 the games are getting riskier, the lotteries are getting riskier. So this is a, a, a trait, a personal trait, and we can actually learn about this and, and check if it does this have an influence on the house selection? Well, I will give you the answer. It's a complicated answer. Let me give you the, the cliff notes of the answer. So down here, we, we look again at the scores. We have the risk averse people people who actually are safe and they always use the, the lottery that are more, that is more safe, that the risk of losing money is not so high. Uh, these are the blue people and the red people are the risk seeking people. Now, does that matter if you are a risk seeker or a risk averse person, how you would select your houses based on, you know, again, showing uncertainty through value, focus or texture manipulations, or if there is no uncertainty visualized. So again, uh, remember zero is the safe zone, um, more towards the four, there are houses in the danger zone. So this is the risk averse people. They are kind of in the middle. If you're risk seeking, you are more likely actually to actually choose a house in a red zone. And this is irrespective, literally, if you like, almost irrespective of the visualization style. And you can see here, when we don't do any visualization manipulation, people, the risk averse and risk seeking are kind of the same here. But once we actually are using this kind of lightness of the boundaries showing the risk, the risk seekers are more likely to buy a house in the danger zone. What I want to say with this, it's not just about the design, it's about actually the human. So the human, is actually the key piece here has to come first. If we know about the user, then we can design the display that fits that user. And also what we, I didn't talk about uh, is the use context, of course, that is always also necessary. I'm gonna stop here and um, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if anyone of you has any questions, please paste them in the Q&A chat box. I wanted to thank you, Sarah. It was very enlightening for me. I was taking notes. <laughs> Visual notes? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> 
don't be shy. You have like this uh, awesome opportunity to make a question to Sarah, an expert in that field. Yeah. So and I realize a lot of material in a very short amount of time. So no worries. It will be recorded. You will have access to <laughs> in leisure time. Yeah. Leisure time. OK, we, yeah. we have one question. How long does it take to do run a study like this? <laughs> that is a really good question. The how long you mean in terms of if we plan for time? I mean, I can answer this in many ways. It has to be as long as necessary, <laughs> as little as needed. Uh, no. Uh, in this particular case, this was actually a master thesis, and uh, Isabella Kübler um, that did her master's uh, running and designing and, and running the study together with us, uh, the advisors. And so Kai Florian Richter, who was listed, uh, was the co-advisor. And um, she, she took, you know, uh, for her master's a, a six-person month master's, which turned out to be a year. Um, so w one can do this m much faster. Um, but of course, we did all sorts of other things that I didn't tell you about. So people say, oh, I can't do HCI, right? I cannot do user testing. It takes too long. In fact, um, the risks that we go investing six months, um, uh, the risk that when we don't do that, you know, is, is significant, for example, in risk maps. Um, so one has to always weigh uh, what does six months mean. And in this case, that would be fair to say. For someone who's actually learning to do this, I see. Um, how uh, a question here, um, how do you measure your visualization is effective and gets the results to the right people? Yeah, that's, that's the key uh, question of, of uh, evaluation, right? Sometimes we measure it by response time, uh, by accuracy of response, if we know that ahead of time. Sometimes we measure it by do people look in the area using eye tracking where they should be looking, where the answer would be on the display. Sometimes we, we test performance um, or effectiveness by measuring even people's uh, emotish, uh, emotional response. We use, uh, for example, um, um, electrodermal trackers, uh, like the, if you know Fitbits, you know the kinds of things that measure your heart rate, your, uh, your uh, skin conductance. Uh, and so we look at effects of physio, uh, physiology. Uh, sometimes we even put EEG caps on and measure cognitive load. So there are many ways that we can measure um, accuracy or performance or an effect that it makes on a human body, if you like. And that depends on, on the research question. Okay, I think that we should go to the second attendee. If you have other questions, Sarah, you can answer by chatting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. It Thank was our pleasure to have you. When we, go back, when we go back physical, we want to have you again. <laughs> all right, I will be happy to share my screen with you all now. Um, just give me one second here and we'll get this just started up. <clears throat> so my name is Cleo Andrus. And I am at Georgia Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology, and that's in Atlanta, Georgia. So today I was going to share with you um, a couple of things. One is called Mapping Social Life and Interpersonal Relationships, and also Mapping COVID-19. So I'm trying to be cognizant of the time here. I know we've got a wrap up around 11 and be a lot of demographic data out there and we have a lot of data on movement like human mobility we don't really have a lot of data on how people are doing in terms of their social lives and interpersonal relationships and if we want to build spaces for people to have good time with um, family friends professionals romantic ties 
all across the board there. And if we want to support strong social lives, which is especially important in a virtual world and is compounded now by the pandemic, we really need better data sets to understand where these things occur and how to build for them. So we use GIS data to map the planet. So how do we map interpersonal relationships and social life? We have really fantastic physical data out there. It is so detailed. We know where all the soil types are. We know the elevation of every place. We've mapped every tree on the planet, types of trees. We know so much about physical data, but we know very little about social data. So I'm just gonna, again, just go through very quickly a couple of quick examples about how to map some social life and interpersonal relationships. This data set was from Big Brothers Big Sisters, a mentorship program with over a million matches in the US. And we wanted to know how interpersonal ties were laid out in the city. So we used Tableau to map um, the locations of mentors and protégés. So the mentors are volunteers from Big Brothers Big Sisters. So people in the community and the protégés here are littles so youth who are at risk and when you see a p here it means that that's the protégé i'm realizing that those are interesting terms but one of my co-authors was british and i think that he really <laughs> he defined those for us so what this map is showing is that the bigs uh this is in philadelphia were from the inner city and they were living downtown. They were mostly millennials and they were the ones reaching out and forming partnerships with the littles who lived in low income neighborhoods close by. We had expected to see more empty nesters from the suburbs form these relationships, but we didn't see that from this data set. Instead, it was people who might not even own cars who live downtown in the city who were the ones reaching out and volunteering. Another type of data that we can use is some social capital surveys. Geographers and urban planners <laughs> tend to know very little about social capital, and we tend to not really interface so well with the sociology community, which we should because they have great data and they geolocate it. So this is a cool, um, a cool survey that went on in the past that was looking at, they asked people questions. How often do you attend parades? How do you trust your local police? That's a very important question these days. Do you know who your senators are? So this is looking at civic engagement. But they also ask about a lot of trust variables between people as well. And we want to know what, in what communities, instead of just saying what race is this community, what income is this community, we want to know how, how things are going there. Uh, so we mapped a couple of variables here. This, is a, this data is very sensitive and it's very patchy. Again, we don't listen to the sociologists. Sociologists probably didn't ask geographers like, hey, what happens if I just have random zip codes? Is that good? And we'd say, no, you want to have a complete surface of zip codes so we can do spatial analysis. But so we need to, we could really improve that conversation there. But this is tr a trust variable in the Rochester area. And this is combining a couple of variables together and showing that in the, in the inner city, there is a lot less trust in general. And this asks, do you trust the police? Do you trust African American people? Do you trust white people? Do you trust Asian people? These are really important variables that go beyond demographics. Here's an example of number of friends people had per zip code. And um, so this is just showing the darker colors here are the number of friends that they reported having. So who has close friends and where do they live and how does the built environment affect that? We don't know till we have the analytics. The numbers that you see here are not the close friends. Um, they're the number of respondents and the people that they asked. So again, if we wanna do good GIS analysis on there, we need a better sample size and we need a more complete surface. Some data we can get from the census. So these are grandparents as primary caretakers so in what communities are the grandparents really important? And we found out just looking by this map that a lot of Native American communities and first generation American communities had grandparents as caretakers. Um, a lot of the African American communities had grandparents as caretakers. And then we saw also a rise with the opioid epidemic um, in Appalachia over here that more grandparents were caretakers. I'm gonna skip through that, skip through this for time. Um, my, my, personal research 
in, a, in addition to this is on social network geometries and how to map social networks within the geographic space and use traditional raster analysis, scan statistics, moving window analysis on these non-planar networks to understand how, where hotspots are. So not just hotspots of points, but hotspots of connected social ties. And we'll talk about this more maybe some other time, but this is a network of the mafia. Um, from the 1960s. So these are actually mafia ties. And we'll have a paper coming out soon um, that plays what we partnered with the sociologists and sociologists. They had mafia data from the 60s and mafia social networks. And they said, oh, you know, by the way, we have addresses for all where the mafia members live. So we have a new paper with about 600 social ties. And then we did the GIS analysis part on it. So we were able to find some cool stuff about where these different networks were located. So that's that will come out soon, hopefully. So I'll give my quick plug on the COVID-19 mapping that we're doing, and then I will turn it over to Sarah B. So I'll show you two quick maps really fast here. Um, this one times out on purpose because at one point when we made this map, we had 200,000 visitors coming to it a day and on an academic server, it, I think the server just started sweating on my computer. It was like, we can't handle this. So now we time out. Uh, this is a great planning tool here that my lab created with Joshua White, who's in biology and his group. And for every county in the US, it gives a risk level. So you put in an event size here, like how big is the wedding you're going to? How big is was the graduation you're going to? How many students do you have in your classroom? And for every county, we take in the case rate, we take in an ascertainment bias, you can choose that here. And then this will show you the likelihood of someone at that event being infected with COVID-19. And we have just done this for the US right now, but we're working with some great teams over in the in the Europe to expand this to other countries in Europe right now. And then this is the last thing I'll show quickly, is this is excess deaths associated with COVID-19. And this is right on our lab website. We view this as a bit of a death tax. So what's the tax on normal death, the normal death rate that we have in each county in the US? And so we calculated it as the excess deaths that COVID-19 has brought out. And some counties, even though they have relatively few deaths, 41 people, that's 80% more than deaths than they would usually have in a year. And so this is a way for you to go around and for administrators to go around and really put some numbers on the effect that COVID is having on their communities and the effect that some, uh, some lax policies are having in their local communities instead of just looking at the whole country. So I'm gonna say thank you and I'll stop there and I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah. Thank you very much. I guess maybe uh, you know, for the sake of time, maybe I should just go ahead and, and get rolling. Um, hopefully Please you can see my slides. On. You can be late. <laughs> Maybe you not, but we can. <laughs> Just for all the attendees, if you have questions, you can again paste it in the Q and A chat box. And Cleo, maybe you can have a look if you have time. And for sure, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Cool. So uh, my name is Sarah. I'm the other Sarah. Uh, I'm Sarah Battersby. I work at Tableau. I'm on the research team. And before I talk about any of my work, I really just want to say how much of a pleasure it is to speak to you today. Uh, not just because I think data and women is great, but because it's such an honor to be speaking in a lineup with both Cleo and Sarah. I've known them both for a number of years, and I think their work is so amazing and inspiring. And um, yeah, it's just really exciting. And if you had asked me, you know, 10 years ago or so when I met Cleo, uh, which student I was working with that would go on to study the mafia or a pandemic, um, I probably wouldn't have said, oh yeah, Cleo, she's totally gonna be doing research on like mafia connections. Um, so that was really cool to see um, some of the work that she's doing. Anyway, I am going to go a little behind the scenes. 
uh, Sarah and Cleo have shown you a number of great examples, you know, like visual examples of how we represent data on maps and how people understand it and how we can make sense of the world. And so I'm going to uh, go behind the scenes and focus on one of my favorite topics about how Tableau is designed to help you deal with the fact that spatial data is just really weird. So my research um, is generally in the area of cognitive cartography, or as I like to think about it, psychogeography. Um, and I like to think about how people think about and understand their spatial data. My passion is really helping people unlock the power of their spatial data and to feel confident that the results that they're getting and they're seeing are correct. And secretly back in the day, I really wanted to have the job where I could be the person in the basement who just did weird magic to manipulate the data to make everything ready for the analysts. So that's what I'm gonna talk about, um, the secret magic going on behind the scenes at Tableau. And while I'm on the research team and think about it from a research perspective, I work a lot with our maps development team, and we have some super awesome developers that are really driven by the belief that our spatial analytics should be the best and that we should seek out the data problems and get rid of them before you even know they're there. That way you can just focus on your data. And I wanna dig in really quick on something I just said, which is that we seek out problems and eliminate them before you even know they're there. Um, why would there even be data problems and what could possibly go wrong? So this is a huge question and one where there's a surprising number of problems that can happen with spatial data because fundamentally there is an issue with maps in that they're all wrong. Every map that you experience is just a different shade of wrongness. Because every map represents a scaled selective view of the world, we're necessarily going to introduce inaccuracies or we're going to miss features on the map that you, as a skilled consumer of real world information, with these super amazing perceptive eyes as sensors, you may see them as errors on the map. Whether you're talking about a map that's been built in like a full-fledged geographic information system or analytics via a mapping service like Google or a desktop product for thematic mapping like Tableau, every map you make is going to have some artifact that introduces inaccuracies. So in many cases, these are going to be pretty small deviations from reality. You know, so small that you may not even really have to worry about them at all. But in other cases, they're significant enough that they completely change the way people see and understand the data. And they do it in a way that's misleading. So I'm going to talk about some of the things we're doing at Tableau to ensure that your maps are as right as they can be without your having to take advantage um, or take any kind of advanced coursework in GIS or geomatics. You can just work with your data. The main issue that comes up is that we live in a three-dimensional world and mapping typically requires translation of that 3D world into a flat two-dimensional map. When we do that, we're sampling the world, um, we're going to introduce inaccuracies just because we're you know, taking simplified representations. Uh, but we're also going to introduce distortion to areas, to angular measurements, and or to distances. And so that means that you can't take measurements on a flat map in the same way that you would in the real world. And those measurements are really key for understanding spatial relationships. How far away is something? Where is it relevant to something else? These spatial relationships that you see represented on the map, they're different than what you see in the real world. And if you don't think about the differences between the 3D world and the flat projected world, you can have some problems, which lead to very incorrect spatial analyses. For instance, if you were to assume that the shortest distance between two points was a straight line on the map, you'd end up with a path that was incorrect. Consider the map on the left, where there are two lines connecting Los Angeles and London. The red line shows the shortest path on the map, while the blue line shows the actual shortest path in the real world. Behind the scenes in Tableau, um, we've opted to do everything we can on the sphere so that our analytics are going to be based on real world distances and directions by default. When you look at the relationship between any two points on the map, we're going to give you real distance on the Earth. If you want the shortest path between those two locations, we'll give you the great elliptic arc. And it's important to note that this isn't how all spatial analytics tools work. Many tools are going to require that you, you actually know how to manually adjust your data or how to manually adjust the view 
or to select a special calculation to perform measurements so that they're correct on the sphere of the ellipsoid. We don't think that should be a burden we place on our users because like I've said before, we want you to think about the data and your question and not this magic that's happening behind the scenes. We want to help you just get to right answer faster. So what happens if we don't do our calculations like this? Um, well, you may end up with lovely maps like this one. And this is an example that uh, I've picked up from Sarah Fabricant, one of my favorite Sarahs. Um, she sent this out a few years ago and has a really nice documentation of the whole process of trying to get this map fixed. So this map shows a really nice idea of just measuring out concentric circles to show how far missiles can travel, but it's really incorrect. Um, and it's a problem. People are thinking incorrectly about spatial analysis, and then it gets distributed widely to help the world understand what's happening around them, around them, but it's wrong. And we don't want this type of bad map to happen to your good data, because it's really easy to make this. We want it to be really easy to make the right thing instead. And I wanted to show that that's not just an isolated example of spatial analytics done incorrectly. Um, the drawing a circle on the map and assuming that circle is right and shows a true distance from a point is something that happens a lot. So just this year, there was another really great example in a Twitter thread from Joanna Merson regarding the errors that were made when people were trying to put out, um, put information out about the, the horrific explosion in Beirut, and they wanted people to have context of how much area was impacted. She really nicely and graphically demonstrated, you can't just draw a circular blast area and move that circle to other places on a map and have it maintain the same meaning. meaning map projections get in the way in a really big way. So we don't want you to wrestle with that. Let me show you uh, what it really should look like, and I'm going to go back to the missile example. Uh, just for context. So if you were to create those same missile buffers in Tableau, the image on the right shows what one of the large buffers would actually look like um, versus the image on the left, where it's just a bunch of circles drawn on a map. And those circles are assuming that distances are the same everywhere on the map. But because it's a map projection, you can't make that assumption. It's kind of crazy, um, but it's kind of amazing. You know, missiles can travel over the poles and not just along a straight line on a flat map. Uh, and this is not the kind of analysis you want to get wrong, because it's kind of a big deal to screw up with things like estimating potential impact of missiles. Because we're doing our analytics on the sphere in Tableau, you don't actually need to worry about these calculations. You can just focus on asking the right question, how far away is something? And we will take care of the how far for you. Finally, I want to tell you about one last fun thing that Tableau is doing under the hood, which is like the super under the hood and I think is the most fun. Um, while I think it's important to do as much as we can on the sphere so that we do analytics right, if the world is spherical-ish and projecting introduces distortions, we need to take that burden off of you. Um, but that introduces some really fun hidden challenges because if you want to do analytics on the globe, you have to know more than just um, things like the list of vertices that make up polygons. Uh, so I'm going to use an example of this really small polygon on my fake globe here. It's just a small diamond shape on the globe. It has four vertices to define the shape. It seems super simple, and we should be able to just turn it on to turn it into a polygon on a map, just like this. But there is a problem. And this is one of those, I can't believe we broke everything in Tableau and had to fix it kind of problems. On a flat map, you can connect the vertices on this polygon in either order, clockwise or counterclockwise, and the inside of the polygon is obvious. But on the globe, this is not true. So if we do our analytics on the globe, there's a problem. So you have to explicitly define which is the inside and which is the outside. And this definition is part of the semantics of the data source. Let's look at what that means on the sphere because this is where we're doing our analytics. In this image, we have the same two polygons uh, created using the same four vertices. They're numbered one, two, three, and four. But there's a big difference here. We don't just need to know where these points are located. We also need to know the order that they're connected in. And when we connect them, we have to explicitly define which side is inside and outside because it is not obvious when you're working in spherical coordinates. So these images show the same vertices in the same order, but with different definitions of inside and outside. 
And if we assume that all data sets use the same definition for inside and outside, we end up with some of the analytics being wrong because spatial data is really weird. And there are lots of different file formats, shape files and GeoJSON and KML and things that come from spatial databases. And it would be awesome if they all used the same definition of inside and outside for their polygons, but they do not. And we don't want you to have to worry about that, even though it's just an inherent problem with spatial data. So what happens if we weren't doing this behind the scenes? So the first thing is, um, when we translate your data back onto the map, we think about it spherically and then say, hey, let's drop it onto this flat map. If we don't translate the data based on the semantics of your data source, and we just assume that we know which side is inside and outside, and we get it wrong, all of your polygons are inside out, which is kind of a problem when people are like, oh, hey, I'm mapping Switzerland. And they're like, how come there's a hole that represents Switzerland and everything else is filled in? That's not what you want. And this would be super strange to have to deal with. So we definitely shouldn't do this. Um, so we need to render the data as you expect to see it. But there's a bigger problem. Even if we render it right, we have to make sure we're doing all of the analysis with it, right? Because if we don't, you get some weird answers. And I'll point out all of the graphics I'm going to show are from when I started testing a very early version of some of the spatial analytics that we built into the product. And I said, I think, I think there might be a problem here. So let's take a look. So here we've got our one polygon and a bunch of points. And we want to know which points fall inside the polygon. It's a basic spatial analysis question. So the points identified as inside are shown in yellow. And here they are, you know, they're, they're yellow. And the points identified as outside the polygon are shown in red. This is great. This is totally what we were expecting. But what if the polygon used a different definition of inside and outside than what we were expecting? Well, if we weren't doing some kind of magic in the background, you're going to end up with a result like this, where we have inverted everything. And this is, let's, let's just say that I have these graphics and I've been hanging out with them on my computer um, for a reason. And it's because I you know, had to, to, to think about this problem in our product. We're taking in all of these different data sources and we need to translate them correctly. And if we don't, then we might invert every bit of analysis that you do. We broke all of this data and figured out how to fix it so that you don't have to worry about this problem. You know, we're dealing with all of these super weird map projection problems behind the scenes. And I have to say, this was, this was probably one of the most interesting problems I've worked with uh, at Tableau because spatial data is just so strange and it's always a little bit wrong and it's really exciting to be building tools that make it easier for you to not have to worry about how strange your spatial data is so that you can just focus on asking and answering some questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop. Um, but I'm happy to talk mapping in Tableau or about any of the fun things that we're doing behind the scenes to help you be more effective in working with your spatial data or anything else that might be just kind of cool and fun. And if it involves a map projection, that's kind of an added bonus because those are way the most fun questions to me um, or just about how everything can be so totally wrong and weird and bad. So. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead. My email and everything is on the slide. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing those so we can just look at fun pictures of people and, and chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the interesting talks. Um, I cannot uh, stop thinking about it, and uh, you got you got me thinking now um, for tonight. So maybe I have to rewatch it <laughs> and to also get some input. So very inspiring. Um, it was a pleasure to have you all here and to see how passionate you are about what you're doing. And I hope um, you got also all the attendees um, inspired. At least I think I can speak for Annabelle and myself. <laughs> Um, for all the attendees, um, if you have any additional question, um, either contact the participants per mail, I would assume, um, or post it in the chat and then um, we can think about a way how we can communicate that. 
Um, so with that, really again, a big, big thank you. Um, thank you for being uh, such amazing um, presenters and um, introducing us to the topic. And so for those of you who do not want to stop here and want to talk um, with all the attendees and some maybe some panelists, um, we have a Remo link which Annabelle um, just posted in the chat. It's a virtual networking Apero space. So you just go onto the link and log yourself in and then you can actually talk virtually with a cup of coffee or um, a glass of water and um, you can exchange some ideas. So thank you very much to the, uh, to the panelists. Thank it you. was very, very interesting. I learned a lot. I will read your article now, from now on. I think that you have a new uh, groupie. <laughs> and yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I, ha I need to leave now. Um, I have to do apero with a just today defended PhD uh, and she's waiting for me. And so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thanks, Sarah B. Thanks, Cleo. Uh, I have to get back to you uh, behind the scenes to ask a couple of questions. So thank you for your wonderful talks and thanks Annabelle and Olivia for um, facilitating. And of course, all the people asking super questions. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.